Hello, 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 and welcome to Empire Sports, your home for all your favorite New York State sports teams. I'm Matt Moran, and tonight on the show, we have Chris Wodorowski and Matt Drexler. Uh, thanks for being on the show, guys. Hi, thanks for having me, Matt. Of course. Uh, now, let's get this season started. We'll start with what has been the biggest story uh, since uh, in New York since his announcement last Wednesday that number two, the captain, Mr. Derek Jeter, will be retiring at the end of the 2014 season. Guys, is Jeter on your Mount Rushmore of all-time great Yankees? Well, the list goes on in terms of great Yankees. You got so many great players over so such a long time, but for me, um, it's extremely close, but he's, he hits number five for me, so I guess that's a no. I go with the obvious choices of, of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig being one and two respectively, and I put Joe DiMaggio, then Mickey Mantle, and then it would be Derek Jeter, but unfortunately there's just not enough room. There's so many great Yankees to be on this franchise. You look off, just looking off the stats for guys like Mickey Mantle, 536 home runs in, in a career batting average of just under 300, so incredible stats. Unfortunately for Jeter, he's incredible. Uh, great ambassador of the game, great statistics. Uh, overall, just an incredible career. It's gonna see. It's gonna be fun to watch his last season, but unfortunately, he just misses my Mount Rushmore. Well, Chris. I gotta agree with you that the Yankees organization has produced so many outstanding players, but I actually do sneak him in there at fourth behind. I know it's gonna be a little surprising, but I'm actually going with closer Mariano Rivera. Being a former pitcher myself, I gotta feel a little for them. Being an all-time saves leader with a .7 ERA in the month of October. That's just clutch at its finest, and that's what you need in a team. Being closer is one of the hardest positions in the game because all the pressure rides on you. And then following up with that, I agree with you and Joe DiMaggio because he could have produced even so much more missing, having to miss three years for World War II. And then we're both unanimous, and I think almost every sports fan would be unanimous in saying Babe Ruth is number one with the 714 home runs, three-time MVP, and four World Series rings. But I do sneak Jeter in there. Yeah, and you even can think of uh, guys like Lou Gehrig. It's, it's really, there's so many great Yankees on this legacy. And I also think it's, it's more about what era did you live in. And, uh, you know, people, older people would probably go with the, you know, the older guys like DiMaggio, like Gehrig, like Ruth. Uh, you know, uh, and just overall just amazing Yankees throughout those amazing years. And now, in the, of course, in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, young people, uh, of course, you know, knowing Mariano Rivera, knowing Derek Jeter. I mean, Derek Jeter is single-handedly the most popular baseball figure in sports the last 20 years. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, but it, it's definitely, it's a hard topic to, to, to discuss and a, a hard only to pick four guys. So we're going to keep it in the Bronx. And, and now let's look at uh, what has been an absolute very busy season, off season for the Yankees, with, with the loss of Robinson Cano and Curtis Granderson, but adding the likes of Jacoby Ellsbury, Carlos Beltran, and now Masahiro Tanaka. Who is going to be the biggest upgrade, and who is going to be the biggest uh, disappointment of those uh, Bronx Bombers uh, additions? Well, this off season has been one uh, very, a very great off season for the Yankees, but list with Ellsbury, Beltran, McCann, all those guys having great uh, careers so far and moving on to the Bronx should hurt, certainly help out this team. But to me, uh, the biggest si off-season signing for the Yankees was the signing of Japanese pitcher Masahiro Tanaka with incredible uh, statistics over there in, in those leagues. With He went an outstanding 24-0 and with a 1.27 ERA. That's just unheard of. I know we talk about all these guys that say they come over from, from overseas and, and they can't translate into into the big leagues here in America, but I, it's really, I think this guy will live up to the hype. They say he's the real deal, so he's going to be the biggest key to this offseason for me, for the Yankees, in a well-depleted uh, uh, pitching rotation that they'll need to make a playoff push. Scott? See, I actually have Tanaka as coming in and being the biggest disappointment. Yeah, it's very, it's, it's very, it's a toss-up with these guys. It really does go back and forth. Like, he's, like we said, he's never thrown a pitch in the MLB. Yeah, and they give him a seven-year, $155 million deal. Like, he, is fit, he hasn't done anything yet for this team, and they're just throwing all their money into him, which they do for several people all the time. Like another one that's the surprise was Ellsbury to get the contract that he did with his injury problems. But I think the one that is going to be the most helpful is Brian McCann and upgrading that catcher yeah. position because they were miserable last year barely clearing the 210 mark for their overall batting average. And yes, he sometimes does struggle to throw out runners as they're trying to steal second, but 
I think his leadership, his veteran leadership, is going to be huge for this team for pitchers, especially one like Tanaka, who's go who he's going to be catching for. Yeah, and that's very true. And, and you know, guys like Carlos Beltran, uh, a guy who can be a big guy during the playoffs for the Yankees, uh, could be ad adding in that. And uh, I definitely think it's going to be interesting to see how this team can come together. So I just want to get your opinion on, on this baseball team. You know, if they're able to stay healthy, uh, 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 and that's a big, big if, of course. But if if they're able to stay healthy, uh, do you think they're going to be uh, destined to win the World Series? Well, you could. It's. It's been proven over the years. You can't just, just buy championships. I don't think this Yankees team is going to most likely make the postseason, I think. But, but World Series aspirations is, is a big, big uh, jump considering they didn't even make the postseason last year. So for me, I, I, do, I do think they may slip in that second wild card. Um, but really, this is a, uh, almost a whole new nucleus for this Yankees team. So it's going to be tough to do. I, I think both the Red Sox and even the Rays will finish ahead of the Yankees, and the Yankees will may even finish finish third in the AL East, but possibly second. But um, it's going to be tough for this team to win the World Series. Yeah, I agree with you that it's going to be tough. But I think, like you said, the biggest question you asked was if they stay healthy. And they've brought in depth in the outfield. You know they're going to be playing emotional for Jeter's last season. They're going to play with a chip on their, their shoulder to not leave him with a disappointment, somewhat like they did with Rivera. But is I think if they stay healthy that they do have a legitimate shot in this division. You know it's going to be tough against the Red Sox and the Rays and even the Blue, and even the Orioles, excuse me, if they could get their season together, but I think they can they can find a way to make a run in the postseason especially for Derek Jeter. Yeah, and what a say, uh, sign off that would be for uh, one of the all-time greats. Now let's go across the city to Flushing, where we've seen some ni nice acquisitions headlined by the acquisition of, of Curtis Granderson. And will this put the Mets in contention of the NL East? Uh, this NL East is, is pretty much head and shoulders. I think the best team in this division is the Atlanta Braves. They're going to be one heck of a team this season. Uh, putting them in contention is maybe a little bit of a stretch, considering the Nationals will most likely finish ahead of them with that very strong pitching staff. But Yes, the signing of Curtis Granderson is big. This is what they needed. They need an out, a power a power hitter in the outfield, uh, but a, it will add depth to that lineup. He'll he'll be able to hit behind David Wright, so Wright will be able to to have some protection in that lineup or after a, a just a really some incredible years with the Mets. So it'll be a big help Granderson in that lineup. But to be contending is it's they're going to need some help from the, from young pitchers like uh, Zach Wheeler. And again, the moves have been helpful. Getting Cologne from Oakland to try and come in and do his best impression of Matt Harvey, which is hard to do, but you know it could be a possibility. Sometimes things do happen; they go right for a certain player. But I think this is only going to help them in the future, but not necessarily this season. They will finish in about that third position. A lot of ifs with signing a couple of older guys like. Granderson and Cologne, but you're asking a lot of these young guys who no, don't necessarily have a lot of experience too, and Dylan G, like you said, Zach Wheeler, to step up and pull off what would be a huge surprise in the National League. Yeah, really, uh, those top teams like the Braves and Nationals, it's going to be hard to keep up with them. Well, we're only 40 days away from opening day, and I know we're all excited to see baseball uh, back in action. Now we're going to take a quick break and keep it here on WTOP 10. Everyone has friends. There's online friends. Friends to go out with on a Saturday night. Friends to hang out with and do nothing. Friends who show up on moving day. And then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness. Are you one of those friends?
Teaching a kid football is one thing. Keeping a kid in school, that's the name of my game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Welcome back. Now let's take the discussion to the hard court where the all-star festivities were going on this past weekend. Now let me just get your uh, reaction guys on, on what we saw where we saw different five different records being broken over the weekend. Well really it's it's it was an exciting weekend for basketball. I think um, fans either you either love it or you, or you hate it I think because really it's, it's kind of a show when it comes to the all-star game. Uh, players really want to want to show showcase their name on national television. Uh, all these guys are obviously big names that they want to rise up against the best with, with Kyrie Irving, who had an incredible, incredible all-star game trying to uh, showcase his skills. But really, I, we've seen it we've seen it before, just guys just trying to put on a show out there, and it was, it was a pretty good weekend, I think, for the NBA. Yeah, you've got to love the offense that you saw in that game. Just to recap a couple of the records, 163 to 155 was the highest scoring all-star game ever with 318 points combined. That's insane. Even with the teams trying to play a little defense in the fourth quarter, too, it could have been that much higher if they didn't start going for the actual win itself. And then a record 100 attempted three-pointers. That's ridiculous in itself, too. The previous record was 71, so they clipped that by 29. And with the West coming in at 56, and then Durant and Griffin put on a show on the West with Griffin setting the single record for most field goals made in a game with 19. Ten of those being a dunk, so you saw a little bit of everything, which is good to see. And then you got the skills challenges, were for which were fun to watch, too. Yeah, Tim Hardaway being the, the big guy from the Knicks and the Rising Stars Challenge. So we really saw a, a lot of great things coming out of all the festivities. And uh, really, for a basketball fan, I'm sure for both of you, it was, it was a really a, a, fun to, a fun to watch weekend. Um, but now, uh, what about Carmelo Anthony and Joe Johnson? How do you think uh, they represented their teams uh, uh, in Orleans? Well, it's... It's very, as a New York fan, with a with a so far a very disappointing season for New York basketball. Uh, you got to be happy with the fact that both teams got one of their one of their players in the, in the All Star game to represent uh, their their respective team. Johnson from the Knicks and Carmelo, of course, with the Knicks. But uh, I think Carmelo played very well. That was very obvious with eight three pointers. Uh, Joe Johnson just being in the game, I think it was good for the Nets. So I'm glad to see that that both teams had somebody playing in the All Star game. And not to pen not to mention. Uh, Tim Hardaway and Mason Plumlee in the Rising Stars Challenge. So uh, I think New York basketball was represented well. Yeah, Carmelo, Car Carmelo, excuse me, did what he did, what did what he's done all season for this Knicks team, with his own record for eight threes, which is most for an individual player. So he represented his team well. Yes, with the net struggles, like you said, it was good to get an All Star in there. Unfortunately, Johnson didn't play that well, but. These teams got to look ahead that if they can get these players still in these competitions that maybe they can find a way to make a push later in the season with guys like this leading their team. Yeah, very true. And, you know, just looking at the game, it, it, uh, looking, do you, I just want to get your uh, like reaction uh, on this type of game. We see sort of uh, not really back and forth, no real defense being played. Do you like it? Do you like the high scoring? Do you, do you think that the All-Star game could be changed? It, it's really just watching. You can see no one's even trying to play defense out there, even as this is the Rising Stars uh, uh, highlight. But no one really playing any defense whatsoever in any of these All-Star games. Well, if you watching the game if you remember the the interview Blake Griffin had uh, before the fourth quarter on TNT he talked about how 
uh, really guys have just been letting other players do their thing. And then he said, really, we were just trying to put on a show for the fans at most. But then he went on to say, uh, heading into the fourth quarter, we'll start to pick up the pace on defense and really we'll, we'll, we'll make it into a competitive game. So even the players are coming out and saying that we're going to try to have some fun for the first three quarters and then start to play defense in the fourth. So he didn't. I don't know how much David Stern liked to, liked to hear that, but um, definitely uh, a good fourth quarter, I thought. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the NBA had to be happy with how this went because – I think the point of this All-Star Weekend is really for players to show, come in and show off their offensive skill set a little bit more than their defensive skill set that got them there. And putting up all these numbers was huge. And as fans, I think you saw the record, mo record attempt of threes because everybody loves a good three ball, seeing that swoosh, especially if it can go cleanly through, that I think overall the weekend was a positive for the NBA going forward. Yes, the it didn't necessarily, necessarily mean a whole lot like some other All-Star games such as the MLB do, but I think it was a lot of fun for everyone to watch. Yeah. Well, now let's get to the discussion of the Knicks and the Nets. Uh, with, with trade deadline coming up on Thursday, what kind of moves do you think these teams need to make uh, for that final playoff push? Well, we've been hearing so, some rumbles from, from the Nets brass and talking about maybe making a move for Marcus Thornton, maybe Jared Jack, Jordan Hill has been tossed around. Um, Guys like Jason Terry and Reggie Evans would be a package to get one of those guys, but I think Billy King would, that would be a nice move for the Nets to help out this team off the bench and to play a guard. So maybe maybe the Nets can make a minor move here or there, but I haven't really been hearing anything from the Knicks side. Yeah, for the Nets, I think it would almost be more beneficial to them to stay with the team they've got since 2014 started. They're now 14 and six in this calendar year. So going into the break, they've shown a lot of positive signs after the miserable start to the season we saw them have. So maybe a trade would not be positive for this team, not that they're finally building some chemistry, which was their original plan to bring in all these veteran players to make a run with. And then on the Knicks side, they're doing better, <laughs> I guess you could say. <laughs> That's in the about as best year. you can for it, uh, Scott. <laughs> they're 11 and 11 in this calendar year. Chandler's back, but. Yeah, I think you really still need to find a quality point guard. Felton is not going to get the job done. And if that does come down to the dismissal of Carmelo to another team, I would not be surprised that that yeah. becomes beneficial in the long run. That would be huge. It's less than 48 hours, so the trade deadline, we've been hearing nothing, no rumors considering um, Melo being traded. So that would be, that'd be something else to really headline the trade deadline. Yeah, and even uh, I know the Knicks looking up for maybe Jeff Teague, uh, an option a as a guy may pick up. Uh, well, I know Nets fans must be very excited after the way they look back in December now, back in that playoff push. Of course, Knicks fans, not so much. We're going to head to another break, and on the other side, we'll be discussing the NHL, some hometown Lakers hockey. You're watching Empire Sports. How do you know he, uh, he didn't, you know, Thank the you kids partner. playing? Go all five. Go all five. Hey guys, this is my teenage friend Fred. Rad! <laughs> hey pal, you want to pay attention to the road? Relax man, I got it. Look, my man, if your bad driving gets me killed, you better hope you die too, or I will haunt you silly. And I'm not just gonna float over your bed like, woo! I'm gonna be making a more annoying noise, like, ah! And instead of wearing those long white robes, I think I'll wear something more form-fitting and upsetting. The other ghosts will look and be like, wow, we've never seen that before. Hi, I'm CNN's Rob Marciano, and you're watching WTOP 10, your television station. everything we are, underneath everything we do, we are all people, connected, interdependent, united. And when we reach out a hand to one, we can influence the condition of all. That's what it means to live united.
back here on Empire Sports Now. Let's talk some hockey, guys. Do you think that Ryan Miller's days are numbered here in Buffalo? Well, yes. As much as it hurts at being a Sabres fan, I do think his days are numbered. You're going to see a lot of playoff contenders really start to make a push to find that quality goaltender that gets them through. Teams like St. Louis, who have had an incredible year, and the Wild and the Capitals are trying to make their own pushes in the playoff race. Um, they're looking for a goaltender. The Sabres, they're in complete building mode. Honestly, there's only a very minimal select handful of guys that are worth keeping to this team at this point still. As Tim Murray is making the splashes as being their new general manager, and if they can get, they would just need to simply look for a goaltender to get in return that can kind of get them through the rest of this season. Well, really, I think even Ryan Miller knows his days may really be numbered in, in, in Buffalo, as, as we see in Vanek. That was, that was obviously in, it's in a distance now, but really, uh, Tim Murray and his new regime, he's really starting to, to rebuild this, this Sabres team, and I think Miller does think his, his days are numbered in, in Buffalo, whether it be... Um, and the offseason, most likely at the end of the season, I think. And that's why I think the Sabres really need to trade him now uh, to even get something going. Because uh, even though we were thinking he might get a chance to show uh, how good he is in this Olympics, of, of course, not really getting the great amount of playing time uh, with Jonathan Quick being mostly the starter for, throughout the um, tournament so far. And now, uh, how will we get to some great college hockey rivalry? As with the women playing two games at uh, home uh, on Friday and Saturday against Plattsburgh and the men's team going up on Saturday at play uh, following their game uh, on, uh, on against Potsdam on Friday. How, what do you think the chances are for, for these guys, for the, for the guys and the gals teams uh, against Plattsburgh? Well, to start off with the men, they got the game on Friday night against Potsdam. They definitely cannot look past that. Uh, but really, it's going to be exciting up there in Plattsburgh. I know uh, the Plattsburgh students, they're always ready to go, especially when Oswego comes up. But really, Oswego coming off a very rough weekend. Uh, at the Campus Center Rice Arena. Uh, we'll see them try and focus on Plattsburgh. I know Coach Gosick is having them uh, make sure they don't look past uh, Potsdam, but it'll be a fun weekend in Plattsburgh prediction. Uh, the way SV goes been playing right lately, I think, I think Plattsburgh's going to win. Yeah, I agree with that. Like you said, they've got, they can't look past this Potsdam team as they just dropped both their games this last weekend. they are got to find an answer. The plattsburgh Oswego rivalry is always great. It brings out the best in both teams. They tied Whiteout Weekend here, but really, I think you got to look for Plattsburgh is looking to secure the number one spot in the SUNYAC, and that's going to be a big push for them, and that's going to get them through to bring them out with a win against Oswego this weekend. And what about the women? I know not too many people are talking about this team. Really, right now, the women's team has a better record than the men's team, and, and they're the ones that are going to be possibly going far in the playoffs uh, if they can make something happen. They got the two big games on Friday, Friday night and Saturday afternoon against the number one ranked Plattsburgh Cardinals. Do you think they have any chance of taking down that number one ranked team on the women's side? Well, the Oswego uh, Lakers women's team has had the best record in team history uh, this year. So definitely something Coach Dillon has got to be proud of with, with her, with her uh, Lakers. But really for this weekend, they're coming off a great uh, weekend sweep over Utica, ranked number eighth in the country, as a matter of fact. But against Plattsburgh, uh, a very, very tough team. Maybe I actually do think Oswego has a very good chance of ups, uh, upsetting the Cardinals, excuse me, uh, especially the way they're playing their best hockey right now at the end of the season, which is always great to see heading into playoff time. Yeah, they're riding a six-game win streak right now, which is huge for going into this upcoming weekend. We saw them take a really tough loss the last game they played against Elmira, who split with Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. And coming off the two wins over Utica, who was ranked higher nationally, They've got a lot of momentum going into this weekend that I think it's a very strong possibility if they don't get the first weekend because Pla or the first game because Plattsburgh plays very strong the first game that they can rebound and find a way to pull out the second game. It would be a huge upset and a really building towards the playoffs as we already know they're going to host at least uh, one playoff game uh, and then we'll see how it works out going down the road uh, for the women. I know with those three goaltenders in Tori Gervato, Catherine Cote, and Bridget Smith, uh, whoever Coach Dillon goes with, uh, they really believe in, in all three of them pushing forward. So that will do it for uh, our hockey talk. It's the final uh, weekend of the regular season and I know both these teams are looking to make a big run. It's definitely going to be fun to watch. We're going to take one last final break. When we come back, we'll be playing our favorite game here on Empire Sports, Fact or Fiction. Stay tuned, guys.
everyone has friends. There's online friends, friends to go out with on a Saturday night, friends to hang out with and do nothing, friends who show up on moving day, and then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness. Are you one of those friends? Teaching a kid football is one thing. Keeping a kid in school, that's the name of my game. My name is LaDainian Thomason. I don't just wear the shirt, I live it. Guys, before we end the show, let's do some quick fact or fiction. David Wright will take over as the face of New York baseball when Jeter claims, uh, hangs up his cleats. Fact. I agree. Fact. Uh, Carmelo Anthony and Mike Woodson will be on the Knicks next season. Faction. I'll go half and half. I'm still unsure. I'm going to say fiction. Both are gone. USA Hockey will win gold in Sochi. Fact. Fiction. I think it's going to be Sweden or Finland. Very interesting. Syracuse will defeat Duke at Kim Cameron Indoor Stadium on Saturday. Fact. Fiction, Duke wants revenge. Well, that will do it for us. Thank you for watching. Good night, Oswego, and thank you for watching Empire Sports. Everyone has friends. There's online friends. Friends to go out with on a Saturday night. Friends to hang out with and do nothing. Friends who show up on moving day. And then there are the friends who'll be there if someone is dealing with a mental illness.